The very short gospel reading we just heard calls for a very short sermon as well, and I hope I may do justice to that expectation. At the same time, there is something in this teaching we just heard from the Gospel of Mark for all of us to consider. Two things, in fact. The first thing you need to know is that we just heard the beginning and the end of a text from Mark's Gospel, but not the middle. In the middle we didn't hear, there are two other stories. There's a story about feeding an immense crowd of people. We got the picture of the crowd, right? Feeding that whole crowd of people with very little rations. Two loaves and five fish. And then there's a story about the disciples being out on a boat caught in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, which gets calmed when Jesus comes walking across the water and gets into the boat with them. If we had read that whole text, it would have taken a long, long time. But both of the stories we didn't hear shed some light on the reading we just heard. And to get the link between them, just meditate, if you will, on this line. He saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I am going to guess that most of you have not spent a great deal of time in the company of sheep. If all you know about sheep is what you read in the Bible or what you see in the religious imagery of countless churches in the city of Rome, then you probably have the idea that sheep are meek and mild and gentle and sweet. Let me assure you that sheep are nothing like that. They are willful and not very intelligent and inclined to move in large numbers and easily, very easily, led astray. Sheep are dumb. And not just dumb, they can get themselves into serious trouble. When God looks at us, that is what we look like. And when God sees us, when Jesus sees that crowd, the response is not what my response is dealing with sheep, frustration or exasperation or anger. Jesus' response is compassion and pity. What God knows about us, because God made us, is that for us to flourish, for humanity become all that we are meant to become, each of us and all of us together, we need to be led. Not commanded, not caged, not harangued or dictated to, but inspired, encouraged, directed, focused. Sheep without a shepherd very quickly get into trouble. They will not only be vulnerable to the wolf, if they have no other option, they will follow the wolf, even to their own destruction. And they will do that because they are hardwired to follow. And my dear friends, we are the same. Human nature points us in the direction of forming communities and societies. We are hardwired to gather and to organize. And when we do, we are on the lookout for who it is we are supposed to be following. Those who are most willing to take advantage of that fact know that about us and exploit it. There is a reason why the social media companies so dominant in our lives today call all of those people who read the stuff that you post followers. If you want to be a social media influencer, you need to go get more followers. And we willingly make ourselves followers of people whose own self-interested goal is simply to be an influencer. We do that because we are by nature followers. Again, God knows this about us because God made us and Jesus 
who is God incarnate, sees it right there in the crowd in front of him. He sees that the people who are supposed to be leading them are in fact misleading them. And he sees how desperate they have all become because of it. We know all about this. We know about this in our own day. All around us, if you can make people fearful, you can exploit their fear to get them to follow you in ways that serve your own interests. If you can make people feel powerless, you can sell them on the idea that you have secret knowledge, some dark secret that explains what they now experience as a world that has turned against them, how it works. It's very easy to teach people to hate others, exactly because we are such willing followers. It is much, much harder to teach people to love their neighbors, which is why the actual hard work of being a Christian disciple has always been a hard sell. Jesus looks at that crowd and his response is pity and compassion. He knows that the solution is not somehow to change human nature so that we no longer need to be led. The solution is to have better leaders, leaders who know that leadership is a spiritual task and that it involves doing everything possible to help all people fully realize the gifts and the talents they have been given in ways consistent with God's hope for humanity. That story that we missed about feeding those thousands of people with that very small picnic basket, yes, of course, it is a miracle story about feeding. It's an abundant story about God. But when you read it through this lens, it's actually a story about Christian leadership because it's a story about Jesus' ability to get those overwhelmed, fraught, exhausted disciples to do something they thought they would never be able to do. And that story we missed about Jesus walking over troubled waters to a storm-tossed boat, yes, of course, it's a story about Jesus' command of nature. Because he is God, it's meant to be a hint to us about who Jesus is. But when you read it through this lens, it's a story about Christian leadership, about how leaders don't avoid the fears and the challenges their people face, but get right into the trouble with them. Many of us are leaders in some way. We're parents. We're teachers, we're members of the vestry, we are supervisors at work. Some of us have formal roles of leadership. Some of us have the informal sort of leadership that comes from having influence in the community that you're a part of. But friends, all of us are followers. That is a Christian truth. All of us are searching for a movement to be a part of, looking for a leader who will inspire us and call the best out of us. And that is true whether we like it or believe it or not. The task of Christian disciples is the task of being discerning followers, of knowing this about ourselves and asking ourselves of every next leader, every next influencer that comes along, whose interests are being served here? Does the aspiration of this leader bring us to a world more like the kingdom Jesus called us to build? Am I being led to help create a human society that is more compassionate, more just, more open to the flourishing of more people? Is the vision one in which all people are given equal dignity, an equal voice? In which our work together is being directed to some high and noble purpose? My colleague, Peter Ben Smith, a Dutch theologian, he's written of this notion of leadership in Mark's gospel as a contrast between the world's ideas of leadership where the leader is over the community 
and the gospel's idea of leadership, where the community's potential, its hopes, its possibilities are over the leader. Certainly that's a model for leadership in the church. And as a bishop in our church, it's a model that I strive to hold myself accountable to. But all leadership is a spiritual task, no matter what realm it's exercised in. So whenever someone offers themselves to us as a leader, we should ask, do they want to be over us? Or does the possibility inherent in our community, however that is defined, does the community come first? God designed us to be led, brothers and sisters. And that means we are meant to be followers, but as disciples, disciples of the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, we must be wise and discerning followers. We must remember in our choices that we are meant to be led to build God's kingdom, show God's mercy, bear God's love, defend God's poor. That is the flourishing we are meant for. And by God's grace, it is the path we will choose. Amen.